Good morning. Good morning to everyone here and everyone online. We're so glad that you could be with us today. I have bad news. My wife is not here, so you get a second-rate welcome this morning from me, but I'll do my best. No, uh, she is gone, and I, I've said before, if, if you let her preach, she just might. Uh, but anyway, it is glad. I'm so glad to have you here today and to worship with you. Look forward to this all week to be with our church family and sing together. Remember, we serve such a great Savior, don't we? And it's great to come together as a, as a church family and, and sing about that and listen to God's Word. So let's pray as we prepare our hearts to worship our Lord today. Lord, we do thank you for today. We thank you for the cold weather, and we thank you for being a God who just loves us and walks with us. Thank you for the opportunity to, today to be here. Help us to live in this moment now. Uh, allow your Holy Spirit to come uh, bind us together as we focus on um, the gift that is your son. Um, you are a great father, and we love you. Um, just thank you so much for that gift of salvation that we don't deserve. And be with us uh, right now as we worship you. In your son's name, amen. Would you stand with us? If you're at home, stand with us as well. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb Till I met you I was reading but not alive all my failures I tried to hide it was my turn till I met you you call my Into your glorious day 
back again To judge the living and the dead Usher in the age to come Let everyone sing Amen Jesus will come back again Judge the living and the dead As we continue, I want to add my words of welcome to what Jeremy said earlier. Um, great to have you guys here. And as we uh, continue our service, I wanted to call your attention to a couple of things for specific prayer. Uh, Gus and Debbie Barquette are on their way to Togo. You need to know that, of course, if you've been around Bridge for a while, you know that every year they go for several weeks. Um, because Gus retired recently, um, they are able to uh, jump into their plan to spend three months in Togo every year. And uh, they picked a really good time to try to travel. So Thursday, um, their flight from Grand Rapids to O'Hare got canceled. And so I ended up calling Gus and he says, hey, what are you doing right now? Can you take me to Grand Rapids? Of course, I'd love to in the middle of the snowstorm. So we ran over there, took us about twice the normal time. He picked up a rental car, drove home. They finished packing, got away at 1 a.m., drove to Chicago through the snowstorm, took a flight to Newark, which got delayed, and they were sitting in the Newark, New Jersey airport waiting on a flight to Togo, and that was the last text message we had. So I think we can assume that they're on their way or they made it there. All that to say, uh, in a lighthearted way, but with all seriousness, let's remember to pray for Gus and Debbie. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with what they do, Gus is a retired medical doctor, and he goes over there to basically spell the staff team at a large hospital in West Africa, in that country. There's uh, two mission agency hospitals, and Gus serves predominantly in one of them. And while he does that day in and day out, Debbie also cares for patients and families and other staff members and things like that. They just completely unplug for what's happening here, and they give themselves to the Togolese people and the ABWE staff members. So uh, we want to pray for Gus and Debbie as God prompts us over the next few months, and we'll begin by doing that this morning. One other item for prayer is just a reminder again that while we have lots of things that bring us joy, we also, as a church family, walk with those who grieve. And Tim and Patty, I'm just glad you're here. Uh, if you get the prayer prompter, you know that Tim and Patty's brother-in-law went to be with the Lord this week. 
after battling cancer for a fairly short time. I mean, he was successful for several years in beating the odds, but he, um, he passed away. And also, many of you heard the news that Karen Richardson's mother, I believe she was 95, Ruth Roz, went to be with the Lord after a lengthy battle with some health issues and some dementia and all that. So I talked with Robbie uh, a couple days ago, and they were rejoicing, but obviously this leaves a big gap. And I thought in the spirit of weeping with those who weep and standing alongside our brothers and sisters who struggle, I thought you might appreciate, just before we go to prayer, a little letter that I discovered that was shared in a pastor's e-letter that I got. So the backstory is there was a, a pastor who was well-known in Michigan circles who died six or eight years ago, and his widow was pushing 100. And she also passed away recently, and just before she died, as the family or friends were going through some of her stuff, they found this letter, and I thought it might be of encouragement to you. Dear ones, I just wanted to, you to know that this will be my last letter to you. We've had a happy journey together, some longer, some shorter, and you've been a very special part of my life. I've changed addresses several times these past years, but now I've gone to my final home and have no forwarding address, so can re you can remove me from your address file. I'm reminded of the old gospel song we sang years ago, on the happy golden shore, where the faithful part no more, when the storms of life are o'er, meet me there. And then she adds, I'll be looking for you. Isn't it great that we grieve, but we don't do so as those who are without hope? And so I invite you to pray with me as we think about these things. Our Father, as a body of believers and as a church family, we come to you today and humbly but boldly ask for your grace for Gus and Debbie as they finish traveling over many miles of airplanes and motors and all of those things. Pray that their arrival at the hospital in Togo would be uh, very soon if it hasn't happened already, and that you would give them strength to get over their jet lag quickly and begin their three months of ministry there. And I thank you that though they are thousands of miles away, they are part of this body and very much an integral piece of what happens here week by week. And by your grace, they will see fruit of, to their labors and we will continue to be reminded to pray for them. We pray for your grace for the Starts and their extended family and for the Richardsons. And not only for those who grieve the loss of loved ones, but also uh, for many in our body, either here today, online, or in person, who are struggling with things that are perhaps known to others or perhaps known only to you. And I thank you that it's through Christ, the great high priest, that we're invited and encouraged to come boldly to your throne. And we trust you today, whatever we face, for grace to help in time of need. And I thank you for our worship, which includes lifting our voices and singing songs that are based on truths from your word, and then listening to scripture as it's taught. May David have the power of the Spirit today as he preaches, and may we have ears to hear and hearts to obey. We pray these things with Christ who works in us all things. Amen. you stand with me? How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountains I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven, spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness.
tore through the shadow of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine so great? Such boundless grace, the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, amen. I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah.
Every trophy will be laid down at his feet. There is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all. Unto the Lamb, honor and glory, worthy is He who overcame, buried in shame, but risen in power, Amen. He is alive, and the stone is rolled away, oh, all our worship will belong to him forever death is conquered and our savior holds peace there is a name that reigns above all others jesus christ the king It won't be long. We will behold him. And every tear he'll wipe away will be at home. The war will be over. Soon we will meet our Savior face to face. Every burden will be lifted in his presence every trophy will be laid down at his feet there is a name that reigns above all others jesus christ the king above all kings and all our worship will belong to you forever amen holy holy for all eternity yours is the name that reigns above all others jesus christ the king above all kings jesus christ the king above all Amen. God, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that you are the king above all kings. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this community. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm not sure if the praise team is either in my study all week or in my head all week. You guys scare me, just so you know. I'd like to sing that first song all over again because that first song pretty much sums up everything I'm about to say here. Um, I don't know why you are here. I don't know why someone is listening online. I have no idea what God is doing with your life, in your life, or for your life. But I want to ask you a serious question that I would like you to contemplate. What sin is currently having victory in your life? Let me phrase it a different way. Let me, let me hold on. Let me say it a different way. Think of a time that you sinned in such gross negligence to God's will. I shouldn't have you think about that because we're supposed to not think about that, so I probably just did something wrong. But you're a sin that caused such harm. That's what we're going to talk about today. I stand before you as a very, very sinful man. And yet, for some reason, 
God has given me a privilege to open up in front of you one of the moral best, pa- I say this every time I know, <laughs> best passages of Hebrews. Just one of the most awesome passages. It's not anything you've not heard already in Hebrews, which is so amazing about this writer. If we were doing this today, people would read chapter one and say, you've just said the same thing for 14 chapters you said in chapter one, and we wouldn't buy the book. He is about to say the exact same thing he's been saying, but yet in different terms, to have us capture something so vital about what happened to us in sin in our lives. I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, please, to Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to pick it up in verse 15. The themes in Hebrews we've repeated over and over, and this passage today and literally catches four of the five themes in Hebrews, the passage from 15 to 22. Uh, It's a great passage, and again, as you see it, there's a little twist in it at the end, toward the end. Uh, Verse 15 is where I'm probably going to camp most of the time, and then 16 through 22 is really the meat of it, but I'm going to spend most of my time in 15 and use 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 to emphasize one thing he says in verse 15. So that's how we're going to break it down. Uh, He wants us to understand that Christ is preeminent, that you and I ought to persevere in our faith as a result of that preeminence, and that he wants us to understand that the consummation of our faith is so secure that no sin can separate us from that love of God. That's what he wants us to know, and then he's going to just kind of sum it up and say, I can do all that because I'm a powerful creator, and I can do that. Um, So I'm going to do something a little strange. I'm going to give you verses that God brought me this week as I was studying through my normal reading. And I thought I'd just let those wash over you because they keep washing over me. I'd like to say my memory is so great that as I actually break down the message, I can come back to these verses and say, there's a verse, but I can't. My memory's not that good. So I just want you to see these. These have washed over me, and I have a little statement underneath each one that I want you just to contemplate as we look at them, okay? What do you think about sin in your life? Do you think this? In the Old Testament, some people died for some of the most gross sin. And some people died for what you and I would say is the most, the guy picked up sticks on a Saturday. Seriously. Probably doesn't rise to your level of importance. And by the way, in our mind, we have a, we have a category of sins. We have sins up here, we have sins down here. And this, well, like, you know, In God's mind, this verse right here is non-negotiable. The soul that sins will die. All of us. My grandkids. My grandbaby. Cute little buggers. Sinful as nature, as can be. Their souls will die. Wash that over you for a little bit. That's such great news. Let me move on. This is the blood of the covenant which was poured out for many. And then in Corinthians, the, 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 the Last Supper is said again when Christ said it in Mark or in, 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 before his death. This is the new covenant of my blood. Christ's blood covers sin. We're about to look at that. The Jewish faith was a bloody, bloody, bloody place to worship. The tabernacle, the temple, had blood all over the place. We would never even think about going near it at this point. How about this one? So when God desired to show convincingly to the heirs of the promise, on the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. This washed over me this week. God's character secures all his promises. How about this one? For there is only one God and one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. Christ is the mediator between God and man. We're about to see that unfold. And then this one just keeps coming up to me over and over and over and over in my own thought life. And there's something just marvelous in this passage that just, I highlighted the yellow, 
And you'll kind of look at, and you who are dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Okay, that's with Christ. That's who he's talking about. Having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands by nailing it to the cross. That would be enough for me. Would that not be enough? Would that not be enough if we just walked out with the singing we had today and that right there, that would be enough. And then he puts the second part on here, which just blows my mind. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him in Christ. God, Christ's forgiveness does an amazing things for us. Do you realize right now, Eric gave me a book to read and it's driving me nuts because I'm not sure I like this guy 100% or not like this guy 100% about the hidden, hidden realm, hidden spirit, what? Unseen. Unseen realm. Don't buy it yet. I'm not fully recommending it yet. But <laughs> it, there is, and I've, I've always known this, there is, a, there is a spiritual warfare going on in our lives. A complete spiritual warfare going on in our lives. Our enemy is not our neighbor. It's no one in this room. Our enemy is not somebody in our community. Our enemy is not a politician. There's none that can save me and there's none who can destroy me. Our enemy is not what we see. It is the sin within us. And it is the world of the, of, the, of the unseen that is trying to torment us and destroy us and bring us before God to condemn us. And this passage we're about to look at today gives us complete liberty and freedom over that world and over that sin. And if you can't see it, you want to leave here today. If you don't see what's in this passage and it doesn't ignite you in some particular way, I beg you don't go out in the freezing cold. Come right up here and I will talk to you and help unfold this even deeper if I can because it is amazing what God is trying to say to us in this passage. Let's take a look in your Bibles with me and I'm going to jump around a little bit so you might want to have a copy of the Word. I know I sometimes put most of it up here today but I might just jump around a little bit today. Um, take a look at chapter 9, verse 15 and I'm just going to, I'm going to read it without trying to make too much commentary as we go through and I'll throw it up on the screen here, parts of it. Therefore, he is a mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. And notice how many times he uses the word blood. And by the way, he's already used the word for two times. Here's another one, verse 19. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took, what? The blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant of the New Testament. Sorry, this is blood of the covenant of God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood all the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost nothing is purified with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Okay? I'm going to camp on this first part, or the last part of chapter, verse 15 first. I want you to take a look at it. He says that they were redeemed from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. I think I've said, and I think Eric said, I think Todd, you've said it when we talk about, preach about Hebrews. One of the things that's hard for us to understand is that Jewish mind, because only a few of you in this room have a Jewish mind, you don't, we don't understand it. We're Gentiles. We don't understand this tabernacle and this sacrifice and bringing things in the Day of Atonement. We just don't get it. We, we're trying to understand it. We just don't, we don't have a reference for it. 
Therefore, we, we might make a mistake and not have a reference for what all that's about, and that's having a reference for sin. The whole point of what God's plan is, is to redeem us from sin. Don't get, let's not get distracted on what the whole reason we're all here for is because God wants to redeem us and provide for us a relationship with him because we have transgressed under the old covenant's laws. The old covenant was written on stone and what he said was, no, I'm going to write a new covenant with you. I will put my laws on your heart and I'll write them on a table of heart and you will be my, I will be your God and you will be my people. That's, what he, that's the new covenant. He wants to change that. And he wants us to understand that we've transgressed. Does it bother you that you transgress? Does it bother, does it bother me that I sin against God within my thoughts or in my actions? Does it bother us? Because that's the whole point of all this. And here's the cool part. From this point on, you're going to see a lot of the word promise going forward. We've already seen it a couple times in Hebrews, but you can't miss this. That there's something that God has promised that is going to move us and keep us persevering in our faith. Grasp the promise of God because that's what we're going to focus on right here. So, God's promise, what did he promise? What was it that he promised? Take a look, if, turn back in your Bible, or turn forward in your Bibles to 1024, that's what I have, right? Or 1036, sorry. 1036, just a minute. Um, this is a really, really important verse. I'm going to read in verse 35 of chapter 10. Therefore, do not, this is a, this is a warning passage we're going to get in a couple of weeks. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what? What is promised. Romans 4.20, Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what God had promised he, God, was able also to perform. The Old Testament saints looked forward to the promise that that was their, they looked forward to God's promise and they held on by faith, saying God is going to save us by a death. That's what the whole tabernacle was. This tabernacle won't save us, but faith in a sacrifice will, and the sacrifice is coming. They looked forward to a promise. You and I look back at that historical event and now we look forward to the promise of his consummation. This whole thing of promise is amazing. Understand the significance of Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. That I will write on your heart my laws. I will put them in your minds. That's what he's doing. He wants us to be different people. And that's, what he, and that's the promise that we're holding on to. But I think in this passage, he, he kind of breaks this up really significantly. Let's take a look at this a minute. I'm not, and I know you won't be able to see in the back the little part I'm about to show you, but it's in the bulletin and it's in your text. Go back to 9.15 just a minute, okay? And we're going to break this out. Let's take the first part. Therefore, he is a mediator of the new covenant, okay? Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. You all know the word mediator. That's some a go-between. That's someone who says, I will represent you for that, and I will represent them for you. We often throw that into a legal thing. I'm doing a legal contract right now with my business, and I have a lawyer. <sighs> Hold on, my mind just went terrible places. Uh, he's mediating, bless his heart. No, he's done a really good job. He's mediating, and he will, he will mediate that for me, and I have to trust that the lawyer can mediate that for me. So all my trust is in this person mediating the agreement. I don't have a lot of faith. This is the cool part. Jesus Christ is the mediator for us. This is talking about the approachability of God. That God has said, come to, come, come to me, and to make that happen, I will give my son as the mediator so that you and I can approach God. 
This is the sad thing about the world. I don't think the world even wants to approach God. They would like to appease God. They would like to appease the guilt they feel in their mind about sin, because it, it's there. But I don't know that they want to approach God. You just led us in wor beautiful worship about <laughs> approaching God. Folks, this is what this is about. He's, he keeps saying this. You have a high priest who will mediate for you. Do you have a sin that's just gnawing at you, that's just holding you back, that something, well, I know, that's just the way I am. <laughs> yeah, it's because we're sinful. It's just the way I am. I say that to Robin all the time. Honey, deal with it. It's just the way I am. And she could very easily look at me and say, could you take that to the mediator and help him, have him help you with that? Because that's what God wants to do. He wants to mediate for us through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the approachability of God. Is that not amazing? Are you approachable? Are you a person that people can come up and approach? Or, or do you need someone that, you know what, you better talk to that person for me because I just don't want. You see how God has opened up and said, approach me. And on top of it, I'll create every system you need. That's what the Old Testament system was about. Now it's in a reality. I, you can approach me. Number two, I love this. Um, take a look at the second part of this. Therefore, he is a mediator of a new covenant. Um, for those whom he has called may receive the promise, okay? The promise of, is for those who have been called. Okay, you had that in your song today. One of your songs had the call. Do you remember the first one? Was it the first one? Doesn't matter. I don't remember, but it was there. That God, he called us out of the grave. There you go. I knew I'd remember it. He called. Have you ever, have you ever applied for a job and you had to wait for the call? You know? And you're like, oh my goodness. I'm, I have a big proposal in right now with a school right now. I actually don't want the job. <laughs> but and I'm probably not going to get it. That's good. I don't want the job, but Monday night, the board will have this big debate between me and two other firms, and they will decide. And I have four people who are helping me with this, this project, and they will be watching online and waiting for the call. Is that not a cool thing, just to be waiting, that you might be selected amongst others to be the one chosen? Is that not a great feeling? and then find out that you actually got the call. Can I just say to you, that's who you and I are? That if you're a believer in Christ, you are of the called. Now that might offend some of you. I know that a lot of people have trouble with this thing that God predestinated and called. I, I would be real careful about that because being upset about that. <laughs> because um, if you go to... Um, if you go to the story of Moses, when Moses said, God, show me your glory. This is Moses wanting to see the glory of God. Guess what happened? God said to him, I will have mercy upon whom I have mercy. He basically said, my calling is my glory. The very fact that he calls us is, is the glory of God. I love the fact that he called me. Uh, your wife, Yvonne asked last couple of weeks ago, how many of you were, were, were saved when you were little? And I guess I was sitting up front, so I didn't see how many, but apparently a lot of you raised your hand. What that says is God called you at that early age and you heard him. God called me in October 23rd, 1977. Uh, huh, I'll never forget. I was sitting right down in here in the church area. I'll never forget the call. God has called us. And it's the glory of God that he does that. That you and I are of the called. What this passage is talking to is people who have been called by God to be his children. I just sit back and go, oh, awesome. Because I've been rejected before. <laughs> I've been not called many times, probably more times than I've been called about things. I've been rejected many times. Have you ever been rejected? Is that a feeling you, got, you like? Some, I see the men raising, shaking their heads more than the women on that thing. Just so you know, okay. This is so cool. God calls us. Let me give you the third one here, okay. The promise of an internal inheritance. I'm actually going to go back to this one as we go through. But this is really cool. He says, so those who have been called may receive the promised 
eternal inheritance. Uh, he's used this word eternal two other times already. He says in verse 12, eternal redemption, and in verse 14, eternal spirit, and now in verse 15, in eternal inheritance. Understand something. This right here is wonderful. I love our building. I love our church. I love the snow. Thank you. God created the snow. I love it. I love sunshine too. I love all of this. This is really, really nice stuff. God did not call us to this. None of this is why we are here. He called us to an eternal inheritance. Um, I don't know how many of you have anything worthwhile to give as an inheritance to your children. I'm at that age where I'm supposed to make these decisions. And I have seven kids and 14 grandkids and four great-granddaughters, so I'm going to divide it all up, all $22. And let them each have one, and then they can fight about the leftovers, okay? The inheritance. God has an inheritance. Now, wait till we see this get unpacked here just a minute about this inheritance, because it's actually quite amazing. I just want you to see that, that this is the assurance of God, that God has assured us that he will give us this inheritance to those who have been called that hold on by faith to his promise. I don't know what the sin is that holds you back, but if it's the sin of unbelief and faith, you're in trouble. God has given us assurance that he wants to grant us his inheritance. Let me give you the last one, okay? The last one. Let me just read the last part of this verse. Eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So there is a death that has to happen under the first covenant, there are under the new covenant. There is a death that must occur. It says right here, since death has occurred, that redeems us. Now we're talking about the meat of the issue, the sacrifice of God. God sacrifice by giving us redemption that's based on a death so that you and I could have an inheritance to be able to call, be called the children of God and be with him forever and be set free from sin. I must not have said that with enough passions. Yeah, thank you very much, all right? Think about what that says. Look what he just said. That in order for an inheritance to take place, there must be a death so that you and I would be able to have the inheritance. And the inheritance is the redemption that we're no longer under the penalty of sin because he died for us. That sin that's so gross that you and I commit, he has paid completely in full there is no penalty for that. And he did it because he chose himself to die on the cross for us. Now, we're going we're gonna to take the rest of the verses. So take a look, if you would, please, at verse 16. Okay? Here's what he says. For where a will is involved, the death of one who made it must be established. Verse 17. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not enforced as long as the one who made it is alive. Does everybody get that? What's he saying? He's saying if you have a will, the only way that it gets in effect is what? Somebody has to die. Okay, now here's the little part where he's having a lot of fun. I don't know if you see he's having a lot of fun, but he's having a lot of fun. The word for covenant, which is he's used over and over again, the word covenant is in the New Testament 30 sometimes, and al almost all the time that word in the Greek is translated covenant. In fact, if you translate the Hebrew Old Testament in Greek, the word is used, the Hebrew word for covenant is the same Greek word that we have for covenant here. So the word is always used in the Greek 
for covenant when it, until it's not. Because in the Greek culture, it was never used for covenant. It was used for a will. So the same word, if you were to, if you were, if, if, if I had a Bible, like if you have a Bible like mine, if I hit the word covenant on, on here, it comes up and tells me the Greek word. And then if I hit the word will, it comes up and tells me the Greek word, and they're the exact same Greek word. It's kind of, he's kind of playing on a word play here. Let me do it this way. What pops in your mind when I say running? What pops in your mind? Running. What? Marathon? So you're thinking, oh, you're thinking I'm talking about running, like running physically, like, like Paul Richards runs in the cold. Running. No. Did somebody think of something else? What else? What's that? Running away. running away. That's still running. Although that's running, I'm running away from something in my head. I'm not actually running, I'm just running away. I like that. How else should you use, use the word running? Water. Water is running. What's that? A refrigerator is running. The car is running. The paint is running off the wall. We, we all the time use what we call contextual understanding to understand language. Language is completely messed up in every language. It doesn't matter what language you have. You have these words, and unless you understand the context, you understand well how the word is used. So the minute he starts pivoting here to the word death, he starts to tell us, wait a minute, this is really profound. This is really cool. Because God ordained before the foundations of the world that his son would be, uh, Hebrews 2, 14, 15, he would be clothed in humanity so that he could die to defeat death. He has to die. So if we go on here in the passage, take a look at verse, uh, well, I should just point this piece out right here, okay? In order for a covenant, a will to take place, there has to be a death. This is at great sacrifice to God. When we think about our sin, do we think about the cost that it was? I ask you to consider the sin in your life. What was the cost? And you may have said, I lost my family. I lost something. I hurt someone I love. We're about to see that the cost of your sin, the cost of my sin, was not just those types of things, which are certainly profound. The cost of sin is a death. And it has to be. The soul that sins, what? Must die. And so he's trying to say to us that a covenant only takes place, a covenant and a will only takes place if there is a death. You have to have that. It's, it's, it's required. Take a look at the next one. Look at verse 19, if you would, please. For whenever, when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to the people, to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats and mixed it with water and put it on a scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God made, commanded for you. So what he's saying here is go to the next step. Now, a death has to occur. In order for a death has to occur, blood has to be spilled. We read in the Old Testament that the life is in the blood. Don't get hung up on the blood part here. The blood here is symbolic to, for, for life. In or when you bleed out, you're dead. And he's simply saying here, death requires the, 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 the shedding of blood we're going to see. That's what's happening. So let's go to the next one real quick and notice what it says. Whoops. Oh, no. Look what I just did. Don't look up at the screen. Just hold on. Somehow I hit a button that. Okay, here we go. The third one. I like this. Verse, the end of verse 19. Water, scarlet, hippo, wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded you. In the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tent and the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything was purified with blood. This is this whole thing of, of the worship that if you came to the tabernacle, you, you offered something and it was killed and then it was sprinkled and it, it was symbolic to, to get rid of your conscience, your evil conscience, but it couldn't do everything the way that sacrifice was. And then finally, take a look at the end of verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. What did your sin cost you? What did my sin cost me? 
insignificant. What did your sin and my sin cost him? It cost Christ's death. Designed that way. Before the foundation of the world. When is a will written? It's written before you die, is it not? This will was written before the foundation of the world, before you and I were even created, that God would die and give us an inheritance. Now, here's the cool part. Who makes that happen? So if I die, I not only have to, not only do I, if I die, do I have to have a will? What else do I have to have? What has to happen with a will? What else do you, you need? One more thing with will. I can write out my will right now. I give everything to you. 22 bucks. Okay. I give everything. I can, who, what do you also have to have? Executor, media, someone to make the will, right? By the way, you need to do that, otherwise the government's going to take all your money and, you know, how that goes. Sorry, that's probably a side comment for some lawyer, okay? If you're a lawyer who writes wills, raise your hand. Okay, we don't have any online, I saw two, so there you go. You need an executor, right? This is so cool. Who execu- who's the executor of, God's, of this will? Because if, if I die and I write the will out, and then I die, can I be the executor of the will? Why? Why can I not? Because I'm dead. Cool. Who is the executor of this will? Christ. Because why? Because he rose from the dead. Watch, go all the way back to one of our first sermons, Hebrews 1-2, that he might be the heir of all things he is the firstborn of the heir of his own will that he then gives to us he is the executor of his own will is that not just amazing that gives me goosebumps to understand how god designed all of this that god in his omniscience in his power said i will clothe my son in flesh so that he can taste death hebrews 3 or 4 he can taste death so that he could have victory over the enemy of death, which is death, so that you and I can have an inheritance promised, secured in heaven. That is what he's trying to say. That is just simply amazing. So we go back to this verse. (laughs) The promise. Everything he's trying to tell us in Hebrews is this. Don't, please, please, please. I just hear him pleading to his congregation. Don't leave and cast off your faith. Don't go back to Judaism. It was a shadow. It will never save you to the... It will never purify your conscience. Don't go back to that just because you're under stress, just because the world around you is beating down you. Don't go back. Understand the promise of inheritance that is your assurance that you will be with God in paradise forever. That's what he's trying to say. Take a look at these verses. This is where we're going. This is the Old Testament saints. Imagine the Old Testament saints. They they hung on to the promises that you and I get to experience today. You and I are hanging on to promises that we will yet experience. 1 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of, or 2 Corinthians 1.20, one of those two, all the promises of God find their yes in him, and that is why it is through him we utter our amen to God for his glory. All the promises. Take a look at that last one up there. Um, Make sure I don't move something right here. And these, though commended through their faith, this is verse 39 of chapter 11, did not receive what was promised. Now, I'm going to save you and let you read the rest of that, what comes after that, because it's really kind of cool, but I'm not going to steal whoever gets to preach that. Do you get what he's trying to say here today? He's trying to say this. This is, remember we keep reading this? Do you see what it says? By the blood of the eternal covenant, but notice by the blood, go before that. Now made a God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of sheep, by, through, what? The blood of the eternal covenant equipped you with everything good. 
never good at these kind of things here. Uh, Barb, this was perfect. Thank you. Barb Yates sent me a poem this week. And I said, oh my gosh, you were in my head. You were in this message head. This is by Martha Snell Nichols from a book called Treasures, published in 1952. That was shortly before I was born. Listen to this. Hope I do this justice. It's entitled, My Advocate. I sinned. And straightway, post haste, Satan flew before the presence of the Most High God. He made a railing accusation there. He said, this soul, this thing of clay and sod, has sinned. Tis true that he has named thy name, but I demand his death. For thou hast said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Shall not thy sentence be fulfilled? Is justice dead? Send now this wretched sinner to his doom. What other thing can righteous rulers do? And thus he did accuse me day and night, and every word he spoke to God was true. Then quickly one rose up from God's right hand, before whose glory angels veiled their eyes. He spoke, each jot and tittle of the law must be fulfilled. The guilty sinner dies. But wait, suppose his guilt were all transferred to me, and I paid his penalty. Behold, my hands, my side, my feet. One day I was made sin for him and died that he might be presented faultless at thy throne. And Satan fled away. Full well he knew that he could not prevail against such love. For every word my dear Lord spoke was true. Can I just say to you that the weight of our sin should bog us down until we're able to let Christ lift it from us and lay it to his Son, who through his eternal blood saved us for inheritance yet to be claimed. That is the book of Hebrews. Do not go back. Do not be bogged down with this world's messy junk. Understand that it will all go, that you and I have been saved for eternity by the blood of the one who saved us. Stand with me and let's repeat this before, as the band comes and sings. Repeat with me. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name hope is built on nothing less and Jesus blood Savior's love through
being here. Thank you for being part of this community. We'll see you next week.